What's the difference between plywood and Jesus? Plywood doesn't scream when you nail it up. On the single condition that you identify the body or the living person of the slave called Spartacus. I'm Spartacus! 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 I'm Spartacus. I'm Spartacus. I'm Spartacus. I'm Spartacus. This is the Atheist in the Trailer Park Podcast. I'm your host, Tucker. Professor Fuzznuts is busy giving himself a bath beside me. Yes, it's a podcast hosted by a Guyanese cat. Get over it. If you happen to like the podcast, you can follow it on Twitter. T Park Atheist is the show's Twitter handle. And it's also on Facebook at facebook.com slash trailerparkatheist. You can email me at trailerparkatheist at gmail.com. Don't forget to rate the show on iTunes. This is a Bible Myths episode where I read a chapter or two from T.W. Doan's Bible Myths and Their Parallels in Other Religions. Next episode will be a news episode. Bible Myths and Their Parallels is a work written in the late 1800s which attempts to show that many of the stories in the Bible did not originate with the Bible and, in fact, predate it by a number of centuries. So far as I know, biblical... Biblical scholarship has generally confirmed that Doan was right about what he wrote, and much of what he says raises rather pointed questions about the Bible and the religions it has influenced over the centuries. You don't need to listen to previous episodes to understand what's going on, but you can download previous episodes at trailerparkatheist.libsyn.com. You can find a free digital version of the book at books.google.com or at archive.org or gutenberg.org. Now, on to the book. Um, This is chapter 6, The Exodus from Egypt and Passage Through the Red Sea. The children of Israel, who were in bondage in Egypt, making bricks and working in the field, were looked upon with compassion by the Lord. Now, let me interject something here. It's a couple of things. First, the uh, evidence that we have shows that what few Israelites who were in Egypt were not there as slaves. They were hired mercenaries and and artisans. so that's wrong um next you know at least the hollywood impression of what the slaves were doing in egypt at this time is building the great pyramids but as we saw in the previous chapter according to the chronology of the time the world was flooded when history shows that the great pyramids were being built so you know we got some problems right here with what's going on. Okay, back to the text. He heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. He, therefore, chose Moses, an Israelite who had murdered an Egyptian and who, therefore, therefore, was obliged to flee from Egypt as Pharaoh sought to punish him, as his servant to carry out his plans. Moses was at this time keeping the flock of Jeruth, his father-in-law, in the land of Midian. The angel of the Lord, or the Lord himself, appeared to him there and said unto him, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I have seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their tormentors. For I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land into a good land, and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey. I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, let me inject here that if you really want proof that the author of this book, this book of the Bible, had a very, 
very small picture of the world as a whole, Israel is described as the land of milk and honey. Okay. 60% of the food crops that we eat in the world, um, I should say 60% of the species of food crops that we eat in the world, originated in North and South America. So, really, if you're going to talk about a large paradisical land, it wouldn't be Israel. It would be North and South America because of how many, you know, how much food or how many varieties of plants were available as food in the Americas compared to the rest of the world. Instead, they decide that, you know, God decides that Israel is the best place for his chosen people and not the two continents that would later go on to feed everybody. Um, and additionally, uh, North and South America, until the Europeans arrived, were relatively disease-free. They didn't have the number of diseases in the Americas that existed in Europe, which is one of the reasons why so many of the uh, Native Americans died out when the Europeans showed up, because the Native Americans had, didn't have immunity to anything by comparison. Okay. Back to the text. Then Moses said unto the Lord, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Then God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And we got a footnote. The Egyptian name for God was Nukpa Nuk, N U K hyphen P A hyphen N U K, or I am that I am. Bonwick, Egyptian Belief, page 395. This name was found on a temple in Egypt. Higgins, Anacalypsis, volume 2, page 17. I am was a divine name understood by all the initiated among the Egyptians. The I am of the Hebrews and the I am of the Egyptians are identical. The name Jehovah was adopted by the Hebrews was a name excuse me. The name Jehovah, which was adopted by the Hebrews, was a name esteemed sacred among the Egyptians. They called it Y Ha Ho Y hyphen H A hyphen H O or Yahweh. See Religion of Israel, pages 42, 40, 42 and 43, and Anacalypsis, volume 1, page 329, and volume 2, page 17. None dare to enter the temple of Serapis, who did not bear on his breast or forehead the name of Jao, J-A-O, or Yahaho, J hyphen H A hyphen H O a name almost equivalent in sound to that of the Hebrew Jehovah and probably of identical import and no name was uttered in G in Egypt with more reverence than this Jow translated from the German of Schiller in monthly reports volume 20 and Voltaire commentary on Exodus Higgins Anacalypsis, Volume 1, page 329, Volume 2, page 17. That this divine name was well known to the heathen, there can be no doubt. Parkhurst Hebrew Lexicon in Anacalypsis, volu uh, Volume 1, page 327, so also with the name El Shaddai. The extremely common Egyptian expression, Nutar Nutra, exactly corresponds in sense to the Hebrew El Shaddai, the very title by which God tells Moses he was known to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Professor Renouf, Religion of Ancient Egypt, page 99. Okay, back to the main text. Thus shalt thou say unto the children 
of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And I just want to add, I am that I am. So God's Popeye. I am what I am. Anyways, back to the text. And God said, moreover, unto Moses, Go and gather the elders of Israel together, and say unto them, the Lord God of your fathers appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto a land flowing with milk and honey, and they shall hearken to thy voice. And thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and ye shall say unto him, the Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us, and now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not by a mighty hand, and I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders which I will do in the midst thereof, and after that he will let you go. And I will give this people, the Hebrews, favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall come to pass that when ye go, ye shall not go empty. But every woman shall borrow of her neighbor, and of her that sojourneth in her house, jewels of silver, and jewels of gold, and raiment, and ye shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. We got a footnote. Exodus three, book 3, verses... I guess it's Exodus chapter 3, um, verses 19 to 22. Here is a command from the Lord to deceive and lie and steal which, according to the narrative, was carried out to the letter. Exodus chapter 12, verses 35 and 36. And yet we are told that this same Lord said, Thou shalt not steal. Exodus 20, verse 15. And again he says, Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him. Lex Leviticus 19, Verse 13, surely this is an inconsistency. Yes, it is, and don't call me Shirley. Okay. And back up to the main text. The Lord again appeared unto Moses in Midian and said, So return, excuse me, go return into Egypt, for all the men are dead which sought thy life. And Moses took his wife and his son and set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God, which the Lord had given him, in his hand. Fuznuts just almost fell off the desk while giving himself a bath. Upon arriving in Egypt, Moses tells his brother Aaron, All the words of the Lord. And Aaron tells all the children of Israel, Moses, who was not eloquent, but had a slow speech, uses Aaron as his spokesman. They then appear unto, Foa, unto, Foa, unto Pharaoh and falsify, according to the commandments of the Lord, saying, Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the Lord our God. The Lord hardens Pharaoh's heart, so he does not let them let the children of Israel go to sacrifice under their God in the desert. Now, when I was a kid, um, I went through a phase where I was devoutly religious, and I read the Bible, and I remember reading this section and going, this doesn't make any sense. Why is God hardening the Pharaoh's heart? And I can remember asking my mother and I don't know if I asked my stepmother about this or not, but I know I asked my mother, and, you know, she didn't have a good answer, and I don't recall... Um, what do you mean, I don't recall? There is certainly no way in hell I could have gotten a good answer from anybody because it doesn't make any sense. If you're God and you want your people out of an area, and you're too damn lazy to just fucking teleport them out of there, 
then you you don't harden the heart of the Pharaoh to keep him there just so you can torture the Egyptians while your people are still in the neighborhood. You know, logically, what you should do is you teleport your people out of there, and then you just you're free to just indiscriminately smash the Egyptians to to little bitty pieces all you fucking want. Why hold them there, not to torture them, but to torture somebody else? Makes no fucking sense whatsoever. Okay, back to the text. Moses and Aaron consent continue interceding with him however and for the purpose of showing their miraculous powers they change their rods into serpents the river into blood cause a plague of frogs and lice and a swarm of flies and so on and so on to appear most of these feats were imitated by the magicians of egypt um and this the rods into serpents um i forget where i read this but the explanation for how that trick was done is that they have there's a, a particular type of snake that is easily paralyzed and so what they would do was paralyze the snake coated in mud the mud would dry well enough so that it looked like you know a staff a walking stick and you know, then when the magician threw the staff and it hit the ground, the mud would break off and the snake would come to and, you know, wriggle off. Um, I don't remember. I think that 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 it worked because there was a, like on a cat or, or a dog or other animal, uh, there's a spot on the back of the neck where you can pinch the snake and it totally paralyzes it. I think that may be how they did it, but I don't remember. I do remember reading about how that was most likely the way, the manner in which the trick was done. Um, it wasn't like they had a special staff that they made that they concealed a snake in and it would shatter when it hit. It was, an, you know, it, it was a special kind of snake. They couldn't use just any ordinary snake. Okay, back to the text. Finally, the firstborn of Egypt are slain when Pharaoh, after having his heart hardened by the Lord over and over again, consents to let Moses and the children of Israel go to serve their God, as they had said, that is, for three days. The Lord, having given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, they borrowed of them jewels of silver, jewels of gold and raiment according to the commands of the Lord and they journeyed towards Succoth there being 600,000 besides children we got a footnote Exodus chapter 7 verses 35 through 37 Bishop Colenso shows and his Pentateuch examined how ridiculous this statement is um and I know that he doesn't give any more details than that, and I wish he did. I know that modern archaeologists, if you ask them about this, they'll say it never fucking happened. There is no evidence for 600,000 people marching out of Egypt and wandering around in the desert for 40 years. Um, if, you, if you look up on Wikipedia, the Exodus, you can actually see a map of the territory and everything and it is okay let me I pulled this up on Wikipedia um, here, here, here's just listen to this part of it. the consensus among biblical scholars today is that there was never any exodus of the proportions described in the Bible according to Exodus 12, 30, uh, chapter 12, verses 37 to 38, the Israelites numbered about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children, plus many non-Israelites and livestock. Numbers, chapter 1, verse 46, gives a more precise total of 600 and 
603,550 men aged 20 and up. The 600,000 plus wives, children, the elderly, and the mixed multitude of non-Israelites would have numbered some 2 million people, compared with an entire Egyptian population in 1250 B.C. of around 3 to 3.5 million. Marching 10 abreast and without accounting for livestock, they would have formed a line 150 miles long. No evidence has been found that indicates Egypt ever such ever suffered such a demographic and economic catastrophe or that the Sinai Desert ever hosted or could have hosted these millions of people and their herds. Let me see here. Yeah, let me see here. Um, here's a section on the route. Um, it says the Torah lists the places where the Israelites rested. A few of the names at the start of the itinerary, including Ra. Ra Amzes, Pithom, and Succoth are reasonably well identified with archaeological sites on the eastern edge of the Nile Delta, as is Kadesh Barnea, where the Israelites spend 38 years after turning back from Canaan. But other than that, very little is certain. The crossing of the Red Sea has been variously placed at the Pulizic branch of the Nile anywhere along the network of bitter lakes and smaller canals that formed a barrier toward eastward escape. The Gulf of Suez, south-southeast of Succoth, and the Gulf of Aquaba, south of Izan Geber, or even a, on a lagoon in the Mediterranean coast. The biblical Mount Sinai is identified in Christian tradition with Jebel Musa in the south of the Sinai Peninsula, but this association dates only from the 3rd century A.D., and no evidence of the Exodus has been found there. And there's no, yeah, there's no mileage. I thought there was a mileage on that route, which um, is a bit of a bummer. But uh, yeah, you look at you look at you know. <laughs> They would have been wandering in circles, literally circles, um, that entire time, which, uh, you know, doesn't make any sense that they could be, that, that if they, you know, if they were wandering in circles like they would have had to have been, um, there would be a hell of a lot of evidence, you know, for if two million people or even 600,000 people were marching that much because it, I mean, they'd <laughs> We we you know we can still find wagon ruts that date from Roman times, so surely we would see six hundred thousand you know the footprints, you know the footpaths created by so many people walking. Okay, back to the text, and they took their journey from Succoth and encamped in Etham, in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day, and a pillar of cloud to lead them the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. Okay, now let me let me interject something here. The cloud the pillar of cloud during the day makes sense cuz obviously they need you know need a route to follow you know a compass type thing to follow. Um but the pillar of fire of night. I mean and I is it saying that they're walking 24 hours a day? Or are they, you know, if they're, if they're not walking 24 hours a day and they're doing like, like what a lot of people do in desert travel, sleep during the day and travel at night, then why do they need the cloud? The, you know, the pillar of cloud during the day. Why, you know, like the, the pillar of fire at night makes sense. It just, it, having both doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, back to the text. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt. And he pursued after the children of Israel and overtook them encamping beside the sea. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel were sore afraid, and they cried out unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Spake unto the children of Israel that they go forward, but lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the Red Sea, and divide it, 
and the children of Israel shall go on dry land through the midst of the sea. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them upon the right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, and even all Pharaoh's horses and his chariots, chariots and his horsemen. Okay, I'm um, just checking because it's, yeah, there's a foot, footnote. The sea over which Moses stretches out his hand with the staff, in which he divides, so that the waters stand up on either side like walls while he passes through, must surely have been originally the sea of, of clouds. A German story presents a similar feature, the conception of the cloud as sea. Rock and r wall reoccurs very frequently in mythology. Professor Steinthal, The Legend of Samson, page 429. So, he parted a fog bank, according to that guy. Okay, back to the main text. After the children of Israel had landed on the other side of the sea, the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thy hand over the sea, that the waters might come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And, and Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. The writer of this story, whoever he may have been, was evidently familiar with the, re the legends related to the sun god Bacchus, as he has given Moses the credit of performing some of the miracles which were attributed to that god. It is related in the hymns of Orpheus, footnote, Orpheus is said to have been the earliest poet of Greece, where he first introduced the rites of Bacchus, which he brought from Egypt. See Roman Antiquities, page 134. Okay, back up to the main text that Bacchus had a rod with which he performed miracles bow, chicka, wow, wow, and which he could change into a serpent at pleasure. Bow, chicka, wow, wow. He passed the Red Sea, dry shod, at the head of his army. He divided the waters of the rivers of Orontes and Hydaspus. Hydaspus? H-Y-D-A-S-P-U-S by the touch of his rod and passed through them dry shod. And we got a footnote here. The Hebrew fable writers, not wishing to be outdone, have made the waters of the river Jordan to be divided to let Elijah and Elisha pass through. Um, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 8 and also the children of Israel, Joshua chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. By the same mighty wand, bow, chicka, wow, wow, he drew water from the rock. Footnote, um, Moses with his rod, bow, chicka, wow, wow, drew water, drew water from the rock. Exodus chapter... 17 verse 6 back to the main text and wherever they marched the land flowed with wine milk and honey footnote C. Taylor's Diegesis page 191 and Higgins Anacalypsis volume 2 page 19 back to the main text Professor Steinthal speaking of Dionysus Bacchus says like Moses, he strikes fountains of wine and water out of the rock. 
Almost all the acts of Moses correspond to those of the sun gods. And footnote. The Legend of Samson, page 420. Woohoo! 420, dude! Okay, back to the main text. Monsieur, Monsieur Dupi says... Among the different miracles of Bacchus and his Bacchanites, there are prodigies very similar to those which are attributed to Moses. For instance, such as the sources of water, which the former caused to spout from the innermost of the rocks. Footnote. Dupi, Origin of Religious Beliefs, page 163. Back to the main text. In Bell's Pantheon of the Gods and Heroes of Antiquity, an account of the prodigies attributed to Bacchus is given. Among these are mentioned his striking water from the rock with his magic wand, bow, chicka, wow, wow, his turning a twig of ivy into a snake, his passing through the Red Sea and the rivers Orontes and Hydith, Hydith, Hidiopus, whatever, and of his enjoying the light of the sun while marching with his army in India when the day was spent and it was dark to others. All these parallels are too striking to be accidental. We might also mention the fact that Bacchus, as well as Moses, was called the law giver, and that it is said of Bacchus, as well as of Moses, that his laws were written on two tables of stone. Bacchus, Bacchus was represented horned, and so was Moses. Box, Bacchus was picked up in a box that floated on the water, and so was Moses. Bacchus had two mothers, one by nature and one by adoption, and so had Moses. And, as, it, as we have already seen, Bacchus and his army enjoyed the light of the sun during the night time, and Moses and his army enjoyed the light of a pillar of fire by night. In regard to the children of Israel going out from the land of Egypt, we have no doubt that such an occurrence took place, although not in this manner, and not for such reasons as is recorded by the sacred historian. We find from other sources what is evidently nearer the truth. It is related by the historian Choerman, C H O E R E M O N, that at one time the land of Egypt was infested with disease, and through the advice of the sacred scribe Fritifantes, P H R I T I P H A N T E S. The king caused the infected people, who were none other than the brick-making slaves, known as the children of Israel, to be collected and driven out of the country. Lysimachus, L-Y-S-M-A-C-H-U-S, relates that a filthy disease broke out in Egypt, and the oracle of Ammon, being consulted on the occasion, commanded the king to purify the land of the, by driving out the Jews. Excuse me, Fuznuts is digging his claws into my shoulder. There we go. Who were infected with leprosy and so on, a race of men who were hateful to the gods. The whole multitude of the people were accordingly collected and driven out into the wilderness. We got a footnote here. Let me see. Okay. All persons afflicted with leprosy were considered displeasing in the sight of the sun god by the Egyptians. Dunlop, Spiritual History, page 40. Diodorus Siculius, referring to this event, says, and I'm back at the main text now, In ancient times, Egypt was afflicted with a great plague, which, would, which was attributed to the anger of God on account of the multitude of foreigners in Egypt by whom the rites of the native religion were neglected. The Egyptians accordingly drove them out. The most noble of them went out under Cadmus and Danaus, 
D A N A U S to Greece, but the greater number followed Moses, a wise and valiant leader to Palestine. After giving the different opinions concerning the origin of the Jewish nation, Tacitus, the Roman historian, says, In this class of opinions, one point seems to be universally admitted, a pestilential disease disfiguring the race of man and making the body an object of loathsome deformity spread all over Egypt. Bocorus, at that time the reigning monarch, consulted the altar the altar the oracle of Jupiter Hamam Haman and received for answer that the kingdom must be purified by exterminating the infected multitude as a race of men detested by the gods after diligent search the wretched sufferers were collected together and in a wild and barren desert abandoned to their misery in that distress, while the vulgar herd was sunk in deep despair, Moses, one of their number, reminded them that, by the wisdom of his counsels, they had been already rescued out of impending danger. Deserted as they were by men and gods, he told them, that if they did not repose their confidence in him as their chief, by divine commission they had no resource left. His offer was accepted. Their march began, they knew not whither. Want of water was their chief distress. Worn out with fatigue, they lay stretched on the bare earth, heartbroken, ready to expire. When a troop of wild asses returning from pasture went up the steep ascent of a rock covered with a grove of trees, the ver verdure of the herbage round the place suggested the ideas of springs near at hand. Moses traced the steps of the animals and discovered a plentiful vein of water. By this relief the fainting multitude was raised from despair. They pursued their journey for six days without intermission. On the seventh day they made halt, and having expelled the natives, took possession of the country where they built their city and dedicated their temple. Footnote Tacitus His, History Book 5 Chapter 3 um, Let me think here for a moment On one of these episodes of the Bible Geek Co Podcast Robert M. Price talks about um, some of the his, the Jewish historical accounts of the travels through the desert and the things that they had to do for ritualistic purposes during this time. And according to him, the rituals they give for making camp at the end of the day and breaking camp at the beginning of the day were so convoluted that there's simply no way they could have done that. Um, they, they were just... It would have taken them all day to set up the temple and get everything ready and all that for their ceremonies that they needed to have to thank God for getting them safely there and then it would have taken them all taken them all day for their to tear it down properly and get it set up um and this is before they're even carrying the ark of the covenant where they have to worry about dropping the damn thing because if they do then you know they end up all face melted like the Nazis in Indiana Jones okay back to the text. Other accounts similar to these might be added, among which may be mentioned that given by Manthello, an Egyptian priest, which is referenced by referen referred to by Josephus, the Jewish historian. Although the accounts quoted above are not exactly alike, yet the main points are the same, which are to the effect that Egypt was infected with disease owing to the foreigners, among whom were those who were afterwards styled the children of Israel, that were in the country, and who were an unclean people, and that they were accordingly driven out into the wilderness. When we compare this statement with that recorded in Genesis, it does not take long to decide which of the two is nearest to the truth. 
everything putrid or that had a tendency to put putridity was carefully avoided by the ancient Egyptians. And so strict were the Egyptian priests on this point that they wore no garments made of any animal substance, circumcised themselves, oh, and shaved their whole bodies, even to their eyebrows, lest they should unknowingly harbor any filth, excrement, or vermin, supposed to be bred from putrefaction. Footnote 2, Night, Ancient Art and Mythology, page 89, and Kendrick's Egypt, volume 1, page 447. The cleanliness of the Egyptian priests was extreme. They shaved their heads, and every three days they shaved their whole bodies. They bathed two or three times a day, often in the night also. They wore garments of white linen, deeming it more cleanly than cloth made from the hair of animals. If they had a occasion to wear a woolen cloth or mantle, they put it off before entering a temple. So scrupulous were they that nothing impure should come into the presence of the gods. Progressive religious ideas. Thinking it better to be clean than handsome, the Egyptian priests shave their whole body every third day, that neither lice nor any other impurity may be found upon them when engaged in the service of the gods. Herodotus, Book 2, Chapter 37. Okay, now I'm going to I'm going to do a quick Google search here because I'm kind of curious about something. I know that in Rome, before the the introduction of soap, which didn't happen, I guess, until like medieval periods or something. But in in in, in Rome, that uh, how people were bathed was they were covered in oil, and then somebody would take a knife, a a, a dull knife. Well, actually, I mean, it, call it a knife, but it's not really since it's not designed to cut anything. But and they would run that down your body to, you know, squeegee the oil off, basically. And that would get the dirt with it as well. There were, you know, they didn't use, they didn't have soap. So that's how they bathe. Let me just pull up something here. Uh, I have no idea if this is a legit site or not, but I'm going to take a quick glance and see what this says. All right, according to, this is reshafim.org.il so I'll put the link in the show notes but you know take it with a grain of salt as to how accurate this is for soap Egyptians used natron swabu derived from swab meaning to clean a paste containing ash or clay which was often scented and could be worked into a lather or the like. The Ebers medical papyrus dating from around 1500 BC describes missing, myth, mixing animal and vegetable oils with alkaline salts. The soap-like mineral material was used for treating skin diseases as well as for washing. Okay. While a few bathrooms and tubs have been discovered, most Egyptians seem to have been content with cleaning themselves by aspersion or by a dip in a canal or the river. At Tebetunus, a center of Hellenistic culture in the Fayum, public bathhouses have been excavated, the oldest dating to the 3rd century BC. They had showers, stone basins, and a stove to heat the bath water. The Egyptians had wash basins and may have filled them with natron and a salt solution from jugs with spouts and used sand as a scouring agent. They washed after rinsing both and both before and after the main meals, but one may assume their ablutions were mostly perfunctory. As mouthwash, they used another solution called bed. And it didn't doesn't tell you what that is. So it looks like they were, while they were slightly different than the Romans, they were, they use some of their techniques as well and 1500 BC puts it right at the time roughly as to when the account is taking place okay now back to the main text 
We know from the laws set down in Leviticus that the Hebrews were not a remarkably clean race. Jewish priests, in making a history for their race, have given us but a shadow of truth here and there. It is almost wholly mythical. The author of the religion of Israel, speaking on this, su this subject, says, The history of the religion of Israel must start from the sojourn of the Israelites in Egypt. Formerly, it was usual to take a much earlier starting point and to begin with a religious discussion of the religious ideas of the patriarchs. And this was perfectly right, so long as the accounts of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were considered historical. But now that a strict investigation has shown us that all these stories are entirely unhistorical, of course we have to begin the history later on. Footnote The Religion of Israel, page 27. Okay, now I want to interject something here and because I have heard Robert M. Price on his um, Bible Geek podcast give a slightly alternative explanation for this. Not that the Jews were a dirty people at this time, but that they had all these elaborate rituals given out in Leviticus, or not rituals, but rules, um, simply to isolate themselves culturally from other peoples around them. Um, like, for example, I know that in one of the, the what sections of Le Leviticus, there's the commandment to not boil a baby goat in the milk of its mother. Now, why in the hell would anyone do that to begin with? And nobody knows. The only thing that we can figure out is that it most likely was a religious ritual that some other group had at that time and, you know, it was perhaps a sacrificial um, ritual for preparing goat and the condemnation was to ensure that nobody from Jewish society followed that. Um, I don't know. I, I'm too ignorant on the subject to know, but, um, you know, Price does have a number of, of degrees uh, in religious studies, so, you know, there's a good chance he's right on this. But back to the main, back to the text. The author of The Spirit History of Man says, The Hebrews came out of Egypt and settled among the Canaanites. They need not be traced beyond the Exodus. That is their historical beginning. It was very easy to cover up this remote event by the recital of myth myth mythical traditions and to prefix it to an account of their origin in which the gods, patriarchs, should figure as their ancestors. Footnote Dunlap, Spiritual History of Man, page 266. Professor Goldzier says, The residents of the Hebrews in Egypt and their exodus thence under the guidance and training of an enthusiast for the freedom of his tribe form a series of strictly historical facts which find confirmation even in the documents of ancient Egypt, which we have just shown, but the traditional narratives of these events were elaborated by the Hebrew people. Footnote, Hebrew Mythology, page 23. Back to the main text. Count de Volnay also observes that what Exodus says of their, the Israelites, servitude under the king of Heliopolis, Heliopolis, we'll go with that one, and of the oppression of their hosts, the Egyptians, is extremely probable. It is here their history begins. All that proceeds is nothing but mythology and co cosmogony. Footnote 
Researches in Ancient History, page 149. Back to the main text. In speaking of the sojourn of the Israelites in Egypt, Dr. Knappert says, According to the tradition preserved in Genesis, it, is the, it was the promotion of Jacob's son Joseph to be viceroy of Egypt that brought about the migration of the sons of Israel from Canaan to Goshen. The story goes that this Joseph was sold as a slave by his brothers and after many changes of fortune received the viceregal office at Pharaoh's hands through his skill in interpreting dreams. Famine drives his brothers and afterwards his father to him and the Egyptian prince gives them the land of Goshen to live in. Land of Goshen! Sorry. It is by imagining all this that the legend tries to account for the fact that Israel passed some time in Egypt. But we must look for the real explanation in a migration of certain tribes which could not establish or maintain themselves in Canaan and were forced to move further on. We find a passage in Flavius Josephus from which it appears that in Egypt, too, a recollection survived of the sojourn of some foreign tribes in the northeastern district of the country. For this writer gives us two fragments out of a lost work by Manthello, a priest who lived about 250 B.C. In one of these we have a statement that pretty nearly agrees with the Israeli Israelitish tradition about a sojourn in Goshen, but the Israelites were looked down on by the Egyptians as foreigners, and they are represented as lepers and unclean. Moses himself is mentioned by name, and we are told that he was a priest and joined himself to those to these lepers and gave them laws. Footnote the religion of Israel pages thirty one and thirty two. And I want to point out that that date of 250 B.C. conflicts with the other date that I read um, from, I guess, Wikipedia talking about the estimated date was um, 1250 B.C. Although, yeah. Yeah, so, so that's a thousand years. That account is a thousand years would have been uh, that that priest wrote a thousand years after the events actually happened assuming that there's not a mistake in the writing here and actually it's even later than that because it's 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 Josephus who he wrote in like 70 AD so it would be gosh 1300 years thereabouts after the events act are said to have happened or are thought to have happened wow okay back to the main text to return now to the story of the Red Sea being divided to let Moses and his followers pass through, of which we have already seen one counterpart in the legend related of Bacchus and his army passing through the same sea dry shod. There is another similar story concerning Alexander the Great. The histories of Alexander relate that the Pamphylian Sea was divided to let him and his army pass through. Josephus, after speaking of the Red Sea being divided for the passage of the Israelites, says, For the sake of those who accompanied Alexander, king of Macedonia, who yet lived comparatively, comparatively but a little while ago, the Pamphylian Sea retired and offered them a passage through itself when they had no other way to go. And this is confessed to be true by all who have written about the actions of Alexander. Footnote, uh, Jewish Antiquities, Book 2, Chapter 16. He seems to consider both legends of the same authority, quoting the latter to substantiate the former. Callisthenes, C-A-L-L-I-S-T-H-E-N-E-S, who himself accompanied Alexander in the expedition, wrote how the Pamphylian Sea did not only open a passage for Alexander, but rising and elevating its waters did pay him 
homage as its king. It is related... Oops. There's a footnote there. Uh, Jewish antiquities. Again, it is. it was said that the waters of the Pamphylian Sea miraculously opened a passage for the army of Alexander the Great. Admiral Beaufort, however, tells us that though there are no tides in this part of the Mediterranean, considerable dis depression of the sea is caused by long-continued north winds, and Alexander, taking advantage of such a moment, may have dashed on without impediment, and we accept the explanation as a matter of course. But the waters of the Red Sea are said to have miraculously opened a passage for the children of Israel, and we insist on the literal truth of this story and reject natural explanations as monstrous. Matthew Arnold. Okay, back to the main text. It is related in e Egyptian mythology that Isis was at one time on a journey with the eldest child of the king of Byblos when coming to the river Phaedrus, which was in a rough air, and wishing to cross, she commanded the stream to be dried up. This being done, she crossed without trouble. There is a Hindu fable to the effect that when the infant Krishna was being sought by the reigning ty tyrant of Madura, King Kansa, his foster father took him and departed out of the country. Coming to the river Yamna and wishing to cross, it was divided for them by the Lord, and they passed through. The story is related by Thomas Maurice in his History of Hindustan, who has taken it from the Bhagavat Puran. It is as follows. Yasada took the child Krishna and carried him off from where he was born, but coming to the river Yamna, directly opposite to Gokul, Krishna's father, perceiving the current to be very strong, it being in the midst of the rainy season, and not knowing which way to pass it, Krishna commanded the water to give way on both sides to his father, who accordingly passed dry-footed across the river. This incident is illustrated in plate 58 of Moore's Hindu pantheon. There is another Hindu legend recorded in the Rig Veda and quoted by Viscount Amberley, from whose work we take it. Footnote 4. Analysis of Religious Belief, page 552. Back to the main text. To the effect that an Indian sage called Visvimati, having arrived at a river which he wished to cross, that holy man said to it, Listen to the bard who has come to you from afar with wagon and chariot. Sink down, become fordable, and reach not up to our chariot axles. The river answers, I will bow down to thee like a woman with full breast suckling her child as a maid to a man will I throw myself open to thee. Bow, chicka, wow, wow. This is accordingly done and the sage passes through. Bow, chicka, wow, wow. We have also an Indian legend which relates that a courtesan named Bindumati turned back the streams of the river Ganges. We see, then, that the idea of seas and rivers being divided for the purpose of letting some chosen one of God pass through is an old one peculiar to other people beside the Hebrews, and the probability is that many nations had legends of this kind. That Pharaoh and his host should have been drowned in the Red Sea, and the fact not mentioned by any historian, is simply impossible especially when they have, as we have seen, noticed the fact of the Israelites being driven out of Egypt. Got a footnote here. In a cave discovered at Deir el-Bahar, August 1881, near Thebes in Egypt, was found 39 mummies of, the, of royal and priestly personages, among these was King Ramses II, the third king of the 19th dynasty, and the veritable 
Pharaoh of the Jewish captivity. It is very strange that he should be here among a number of other kings if he had been lost in the Red Sea. The mummy is wrapped in rose-colored and yellow linen of a texture finer than the finest Indian muslin upon which lotus flowers are strewn. It is in a perfect state of preservation. See a Cairo August 8th letter to the London Times. Okay, back to the main text. Dr. Inman, speaking of this, says, We seek in vain amongst the Egyptian hieroglyphs for scenes which recall such cruelties as those we read, we read of in the Hebrew records. And in the writings which have hitherto been translated, we find nothing resembling the wholesale destructions described and applauded by the Jewish historians as perpetuated by their own people. That Pharaoh should have pursued a tribe of diseased slaves whom he had driven out of his country is altogether improbable. In the words of Dr. Knappert, we may conclude by saying that this story, which was not written until more than 500 years after the Exodus itself, can lay no claim to be considered historical. Okay, that's it for that chapter. All right, and I just want to check Wikipedia here for a second. I'm curious if he, if Ramses II is actually the pharaoh. Well, yep, 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 yep. Um, he would have been the pharaoh, huh? He led several military expeditions into the Levant, reasserting Egyptian control over Canaan. He also led expe expeditions to the south into Nubia, uh, commemorated in the inscriptions at the at Beit El Wali and Gurf Hussein. Um, yeah, so he would have been that he would have been the pharaoh, all right. There's nothing. I'm just doing a quick scan of the uh, Wikipedia article. Um, yeah, there's nothing in here at all in the Wikipedia article, um, just in a quick scan that indicates he uh, had anything to do. There's no mention of the Israelites at all. Yeah, nothing. Um, popular culture. Huh. Ah, there we go. All the way down at the bottom of popular culture, it says, Ramses II is one of the more popular candidates for the Pharaoh of the Exodus. He is cast in this role in the 1944 novella Das Gesicht, The Law, by Thomas Mann. Although not a major character, Ramses appears in Joan Grant, So Moses Was Born, a first-person account from Nebunifer, the brother of Ramses, who paints a picture of the life of Ramses from the death of Seti, replete with power play, intrigue, and assassination plots of the historical record, and depicting the relationships with Bintanath, Queen Tuya, Neferati, and Moses. In film, Ramses was played by Yul Brenner and Cecil B. Mill's classic, The Ten Commandments. Here, Ramses was portrayed as a vengeful tyrant as well as the main antagonist of the film, ever scornful of his father's preference for Moses over the son of his body. Huh. But that's it. You would have thought that they would have had a little more. Um, and then again, it is Wikipedia, so it's not 100% accurate. And if you've never heard of a band called The Fugs, who had... Allen Ginsberg is one of their members. They did a song called The Ten Commandments. Um, I won't splice it in here because that'll be a massive violation of copyright laws. Um, but you can find it on YouTube. Okay, so that's the end of the chapter. And since I'm at the about the hour mark, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. Yes, Flesh Nuts, we're going to say goodnight now. You can follow the show on Twitter. T Park Atheist is the show's Twitter handle. And it's also on Facebook at facebook.com slash trailer park atheist. You can email me at trailer park atheist at gmail.com. Don't forget to rate the show on iTunes. The next episode will be a news episode. 
Say goodnight, Fuzznut. Damned cat. All I know is this violates every canon of respectable broadcasting.